Hear now the very word of God as it is given to us in the Gospel of Luke, reading from the 15th chapter, verses 11 through 16. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. May the Lord bless this reading of his word to our understanding this morning. Let's ask him for illumination. Dear Lord, what a magnificent, what a brilliant parable you have um, established and shared with us over the millennia. We know that in order to understand this, we're going to have to step out of our culture and step into the culture that existed when you were here in human bodily form. I pray that you will help us do that. I, I pray that you will help us make the correlation between the redemptive plan that you put in place and this parable in its entirety. Now, that's going to be uh, require some, some doing because we're going to spread it out over several weeks. So I pray that you will keep us focused on this all through the time that we study it. We'll give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. Sproul said on various occasions, various times, that if you're going to understand Reformed theology, you need to start with the concept of total depravity. Now, that's kind of a misnomer. Um, he doesn't like that phrase. I don't like it either. He replaces total depravity with the, um, uh, the, the word of radical corruption. Radical comes from the Latin word radix, which means root, and it means that you, we are corrupted from the root. To be totally depraved does not mean that you are as bad as you can be. It doesn't mean that you're, uh, you're the worst uh, form of a human being, because most of us can look around and we can say, well, you know, Hitler was a little bit worse than maybe I am in the way that he treated other people, but it means, total means that it is complete. It's all of us that is fallen. Our minds, our bodies, our emotions, our inclinations, our motivations, our souls, our will, everything has fallen into depravity. There's no part of us that hasn't done that. Now, the parable that Jesus is teaching us speaks of this, even though he doesn't use the same terminology, we are going to see that what he is doing is mapping out not just a story about a recalcitrant son in a dysfunctional family. This is a story about the fall of humanity and the redemption that God brings about with that humanity. So with that said, if you've got your Bibles with you, turn them back to the, 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 the third chapter of Genesis. Keep your finger there in Luke. We're going to come right back to it. But I'm going to read you a couple of of the passages so that they're familiar to you or they're in your mind as far as what the, the scripture teaches as original sin. Uh, and original sin is not so much the actual sin we are going to see as it is what happens as a result of it. I'm going to start reading in chapter 3 verse 9 and following because this is kind of where this all came about. God has already warned Adam and Eve that there is one tree in all of the garden that they are not to, to eat from or even touch. And of course, Satan comes along and begins to tempt Eve. And Eve responds first in the ninth verse by saying, but the Lord called to, I'm sorry, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm switching these. Uh, I've, I've already jumped down. Uh, this is happening after the temptation occurred, after the original sin actually occurred. The Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, and classically and famously, the woman whom you gave to me to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree, and I ate. 
Then the Lord said to the woman, what is it that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The serpent came into the garden and deceived her. Now, the way that he deceived her and the way that she fell is extremely significant this morning. Now back up to the third verse where I'd like to start reading again. Eve says to the serpent when he tempts her, you shall not eat, God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig, legs, fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. That's the, the heart of what we call the original sin. And basically the importance of the original sin is this. What Satan tempted the woman with was not just the eating of a fruit. And it's not just the breaking of a commandment. What the Satan tempted Eve with, and also the man, and they both fell into this, was the desire for autonomy. Now, autonomy is just a word that means that I self-rule. I have my own law. I autonomos, nomos being the law. I have my own law. I'm the one who determines good and evil. Now, God told them that if you do this, you will die. And when they did this, they took a calculated risk. In their mind, I'm supposing. And that calculated risk was who's telling the truth, God or this serpent over here. Because I am tempted, because I would like to be my own boss. I would like to be in charge. In fact, I would like to be God. I would like to determine what is good and evil. I would like to determine what is right and wrong. I would like to set all my own standards. And I am willing to risk dying to God in order to do it. In order to have what I want. This is right out of this parable. This is what Jesus is teaching us in this parable. Is that when Adam and Eve fell, they were willing to die to God and have God die to them. They were willing to go into an abject separation from God. And be eliminated from the Garden of Eden. And to live a life of, of a, under the curse of God. And so therefore God has set in, 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 in plan his plan of redemption. Now, this is the foundation. If you're going to understand the plan of redemption, if you're going to understand why it was necessary for Jesus to come, if you are going to understand why you personally need a Savior, then you must understand the concept of total depravity. You were conceived in sin. You were born in sin. And there is not a moment that you have lived that you have not sinned. Your sin consumes you. And that's the reason that you need a Savior. But as, as central as this is, it is one of the most hated doctrines, not only of the secular unbelieving world around us, who says, what do you mean, you're going to tell me that I, I'm sinful? I, I beg to differ. I'm a really good person. I, you know, I'm better than this, the person next to me, and, and I respect other people, and I do nice things, and oh yes, maybe I don't do everything right, but you know, my God is a God who winks at those kinds of things and doesn't really care. And so therefore, they, 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 are, they are angry at the idea of original sin and of a radical corruption that results from this. And unfortunately, that has seeped its way into the church. But there's a danger when you begin to redefine what sin is. You see, we, anyone who's honest with themselves has to look around and say, guess what? I, no, I'm not perfect. And you'll hear people say that all the time. Who will deny the fact of original sin? They will say, oh, no, I'm not perfect. Okay, so how come you're not perfect? How come you have any sin whatsoever? And what will that sin do? And how will that sin stand before a holy God? Now, the way that they handle it is to say, okay, well, that's not a sin. <laughs> you call it a sin, I don't call it a sin. I'm good. All right? I can do that all I want. What, is, what have they just done? 
the exact same sin that Adam and Eve did to determine what is good and evil. But there's a problem with this. There's a problem that happens with a fallen soul. When you start to remove boundaries, the fallen soul will always find the limits of its boundaries and press against those boundaries. And if you begin to remove the boundaries or to say that they're not boundaries at all, you take the laws and the, and the commandments away and you say that's no longer a sin, that's no longer a boundary. Well, the boundary falls, but the fallen heart doesn't stop there. It continues to press the outer limits of that. And if there are no boundaries and all boundaries are taken away, you end up like the prodigal son. The fallen soul implodes upon itself. Because it keeps pressing the outer limits of its boundaries. Now I know that this is quite often taught as a very simple parable, but it's not. This is a very brilliant parable by Jesus. It shows his brilliant intellect. And I hope to just bring out a wee part of that. Now you know that this parable, if you've been here over the last couple of weeks, you know that this is the third of a trilogy of parables that Jesus has taught. And it all started, we're not told where he is, he's somewhere in Judea or Perea, but it all started when it became apparent that a whole bunch of sinners are following after Jesus, probably because of his perfect imago Dei. We talked about that image of God that fell when Adam and Eve fell. Well, he probably was bringing those because they're looking for salvation, but of course the Pharisees, the pious religious leaders of the day, grumbled because they didn't like it. You see, they were separationists. They didn't want anything to do with this kind of sinfulness. And so therefore, they're grumbling against Jesus because he's hobnobbing with riffraff. And that's the reason Jesus tells these three parables. The three parables are about something that was lost. First a sheep that was lost, and then a coin that is lost, and now a son that is lost, that is found. The shepherd finds the sheep, puts it on his shoulder, and takes it back to the village to reunite it with its master and with its home. Notice that the, excuse me, the joy was a joy not just of finding, but a joy of restoration. And then he told a parable about a woman who had a coin and she had 10 of them and lost one of them and it fell into the floor and was covered up in the dust and she gets a lamp out and a broom and she goes to work sweeping the floor until she finds the coin. And we talked about the amazing um, relationship that we're already seeing because we know that Jesus is represented to us as a shepherd and so that kind of focuses on Jesus and the second one we know that the light was the Holy Spirit working through the woman who represents the church I'm not allegorizing this Jesus is the one who applied both of these parables and applied them to the redemptive process when one sinner repents all heaven erupts well Let's not forget that word repentance because that was central to what Jesus said. Now, we're going to see repentance in a much clearer, more articulated way in this parable here. But I want you to remember the sovereignty that you saw in the first two parables. The sheep did not save itself. It didn't find itself and it didn't restore itself, nor did the coin. There's that same concept of the sovereignty of God in this process. Now, of course, in this one, we're looking at God the Father. The sovereignty of God continues into this one. Now, that's the background. Insufficient, but at least we've got a little bit of a background. Let's turn now to the text and see if we can begin to understand this. You're going to have to step out of your culture with me. You cannot understand this if you look at it in a 21st century culture. Notice where it starts. Verse 11. And he said there was a man who had two sons. I would would say that the, uh, and I've said this before, that the title of this parable, the parable of the prodigal son, is a misnomer. It's misnamed. Jesus names the parable right here. It is a parable about a father and two sons. It is a parable about a loving father and two wayward sons. Now, we're going to look at the first son. And actually, if you look at the three characters of this, we're going to look at the first son today. Most of the action is through the first son, but he's not the main character. In fact, I would even say that the elder brother is more significant in the way Jesus is telling this because remember who he's talking to. 
He's talking to the Pharisees who are grumbling against him. They're the older brother. So in other words, this is important that, uh, that, that we look at that. But the main character here is the father and the love of the father and the redemption of the father and the forgiveness of the father. I mean, I mean that's the focus. Now today, we're going to focus mainly on the younger son because he's the one who rebels. But I do believe that it is, it is misnamed except for the word prodigal. Most people just take prodigal as, a, as almost a common name. It's not. Prodigal is a word that means an extravagant wastefulness, a reckless wastefulness. And that's right on because that's exactly what this part of the parable is about. So let's begin in the 12th verse. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of pro property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Now, when I say that we have to step out of our culture, the reason we have to is because this doesn't sound all that bad to us, does it? This doesn't sound to be something that could not possibly ever happen because we live in probably one of the most entitled, self-indulgent youth um, uh, views of, of youth that have ever existed in the history of humanity. And that's a big statement, but I don't think there has ever been a time that we have had children who are more indulgent, more entitled, who expect everything from their parents that leave them as soon as they possibly can. And it would be nothing for a child of today to go to their father or their mother and say, give me what's coming to me. In fact, you hear stories every now and then about children suing their parents because they haven't done as they expected them to do. To dishonor your parents is nothing to them. To blame them for everything is nothing to them. Now, don't start looking down and thinking that I'm talking about the Gen Z's and the Gen X's because this started way back post-war, 1950s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. The grandparents and the parents of these children, that's where this youth culture began. And it is probably the most dishonoring youth culture that has ever existed on this planet. So it's going to be hard for us to understand how egregious what this son asks his father to do actually is. I've been enjoying reading a scholar. His name is Kenneth Bailey. I think I've mentioned him before. He's written a couple of books. And he's a Middle Eastern professor. He, I think he's taught in Beirut and other places in Lebanon and Syria and, and spent most of his life in the Middle East and about 15 of those years actually spending time in Middle Eastern peasant villages. And he's written some books about the parables of Luke from a peasant perspective. So he's been out there checking with modern day peasants in the Middle East Seeing, well, how would this fly? If someone were to do what Jesus says here, if he were to come up to his father in perfect health and say, I want you to give me my inheritance, this is what he writes. For 15 years, I have been asking people of all walks of life, from Morocco to India, from Turkey to the Sudan, about the implication of a son's request for his inheritance while the father is still living. The answer has almost always been emphatically the same. Impossible. It could never happen. He gives us a common um, conversation. He asks the question of the villager. Has anyone ever made such a request in your village? The answer from the villager, never. Could anyone ever make such a request? The answer from the villager, impossible. If anyone ever did... What would happen? Important response. His father would beat him, of course, without question. Why? He asked. Now, this is so significant. This request means in that culture, I want you to die. I want you to die. And I want you to die late, sooner than, la than later. Now, he goes on and says this. Of the hundreds of times that... I have asked this question only twice has anyone ever said to me talking about the places in the Middle East only twice has anyone ever said to me oh I've heard of that happening 
On the first occasion, a son asked very similar to this, his father in perfect health for his inheritance. The father was so stunned and so devastated and so heartbroken that a man in perfect health died in three months. The widow was interviewed and she said he died the day that his son asked him for the inheritance because it means I want you to die. The other example happened more likely, more like everyone would expect. What happened when the son asked the father for his inheritance? The father beat the son senseless, senseless, threw him out of the house, ran him out of the village, took him out of his inheritance and out of his life. That's what would normally happen. There's only one incident. This is the most unique parable you're ever going to find. Again, Kenneth Bailey continuing writes this. He says, the startling fact is that to my knowledge in all Middle Eastern literature, aside from this parable, from ancient times to the present, there is no case of any son, older or younger, asking for his inheritance from a father who is still in good health. Did you have any idea that what Jesus is saying here is that unique? This would have shocked his audience. You've got to be kidding me. No one would actually do that. And the reason being is because it is dishonoring to the father. It is to say, Father, I want you to die. Because more important to me, to your life, is for me to get what I want. So you can die to me and I can die to you. And it doesn't matter at all to me. I just want your stuff. I want the property. But not only was it dishonoring to the father, it was actually also what actually happened here is illegal. I mean, the, the, it, it was not completely uncommon that a man would, would assign uh, some of his property to his sons during his lifetime. Now, again, the difference between being demanded and, do, and doing it on his own accord is different. One of the examples that was given was that, well, let's say the man had a wife and he has two sons by that wife. And then either because the wife dies or they get divorced, he gets ready to have a second wife. Well, to protect his sons from the sons of his second wife, he might give the property away or assign the property away to the sons. Okay, that was understandable. But the Mishnah, and you know that the Mishnah is the rabbinic writings, the law of Israel, if you will... They were required, he must write this from today and after my death. In other words, you have to include that you do not own or you cannot take this property until after I am dead. The legality of this, I know it's a little bit complicated, but let me explain it. It's important. The legality of this is that if the, if the father, if a man gives his property away to his son, in other words, assigns it as if he did in a will, it no longer is his property. In other words, he can't sell it. The man can't sell it because he has given it to the son. By the same token, the son can't sell it because it is for the father to use and to control until he dies. But the ownership belongs to the son. That makes this even more extraordinary. Because not only did this, this impertinent and dishonoring son say, I want you to give me my inheritance. He said, I want it right now. Because I want to take it with me. In other words, I don't want you to wait by the law until you die for me to be able to sell what is mine. I want to sell it right now because I'm leaving. And when I leave, I want to take my inheritance with me. And right now, it is all tied up in land. Don't think they had money in the bank. He didn't go and write a check. His inheritance is in land and livestock and crops and yield. That's where his inheritance was. He had to turn all of that into cash before he was going to be able to leave. So not only does this, this, this dishonoring boy ask his father the unaskable, which was to give me my property before you die, he says, I want you to release it 
so that I can sell it, so that I can turn it into cash. I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the closeness to what happened in the garden. Because you see, what happened in the garden was so completely close to the same thing. God told Adam and Eve, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, no, you will not die. And the serpent was convincing enough for the woman. But again, as I said earlier, Adam and Eve made a calculated uh, move. Okay, it is worth it to me to lose my relationship with my father, with my creator, with my God. I know what I'm doing. It's not like God did not tell them what would happen. It's not like they were driven by some kind of lust of the flesh. This was an intellectual, moral question. You will be like God. You will make good and evil. You will be autonomous. It is worth it to me for the shadow to become the reality. The image of God to become God or a goddess. So go ahead and die, Father. I don't need you anymore. I'm going to be my own God. And it's okay if I die to you. Because I don't need you anymore. I just want the power. And the control, and people wonder why the fall is so complete. But that is exactly what happened as far as when the son asked that. But we're not over. We're not done with what would totally blow everyone Jesus is talking to away. Oh, yes, this question, this request by the son, this was huge. But it pales Next to what we read next. I mean, this just doesn't make any sense. And he divided his property between them. You heard what would happen. He would beat him senseless, drive him out of his house, and out of his will, and out of his life. That is what the response would have normally been. And that's what every single Pharisee there expected to be part of this. But instead, the father complied. This is unbelievable. This would never happen. The father said, okay, not only did he comply and say, I'll give you your, your share, but I will let you sell it. Brothers and sisters, you've got to remember something. Property was at a premium there. I mean, you didn't go out and buy a house like we do now or try to buy or rent and then buy. No, you lived on the property that your ancestors gained through sweat and blood and toil. And have held on to through famine, through good and bad. There are generations, maybe millennia, of family who have lived on that property. And the father said, okay, go ahead. Not only am I going to give you your part in it, I am going to let you sell it. I want you to see something here. The parable, the main thing about the parable is the love of the father. It's to underscore the father's love for his son. I want you to see what Jesus is told in these three parables. The, the, the love of the shepherd for his lost sheep did not end when the sheep was lost. I mean, he was willing to leave the 99 and go out into the desert and find his sheep. And so upset was he, so broken was he, the, the lost sheep, that he rejoiced when he found him and restored him. Same thing with the coin. The coin was something that the woman was going to seek for until she found it. It never ceased being hers. It was her coin even though it was buried in the muck. The father's love transcends this. The father is willing to love his son even though he asks him the impossible. The son doesn't love the father at all. The sheep didn't love the shepherd and the coin didn't love the woman but the father, the woman and the shepherd love those who are lost completely and totally. There is a love that continues through this. So the question might be asked, well why didn't the father say no? I mean all he had to do is say go go to your room you know, And, and we'll talk about this later. I'm not thinking about letting you have my property. Are you kidding me? We'll have a nice conversation about this some other time. How come the father didn't do that? How come God allows evil? How come God allows bad things to happen? 
How come God didn't stop the serpent in the garden? I can tell you why this father lets his son go. Because he doesn't need a puppet son. He doesn't need an incarcerated son. He doesn't need watered down, fake, hypocritical love from a son who would rather be someplace else. He's already got one of those. What he wants is true love. And what God wants from us is true love. That is what Jesus wants from you is true love. With your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Everything that you are. Every fiber in your body. Loving God. That is what he wants and he will not accept anything less. And the only way that is going to be restored is if the Imago Dei is restored. Because only one person ever loved God the way he should be loved. And that was Jesus Christ in the flesh. So therefore he let him go. Powerful, powerful story there. And once again, we're not talking about property and money. We're talking about souls. We're talking about the fall of radical corruption of the Imago Dei and God's plan to restore it. Third character, and I just want to touch on him because actually we're going to get more about the father next week and then probably the following week, the, the elder son. But there's one thing you should recognize about that elder son. Deuteronomy tells us that when property is divided this way, two-thirds of it goes to the oldest son and a third of it goes to the younger so it would have been a two-thirds, one-third split. There, obviously, the lion's share goes to the elder son. Notice what Jesus says here. He says, and he divided his property between them. What that means is even though it was the younger son that asked for the property, the father gave it to the two of them. Okay? He assigned, he gave it, he, he transferred it to both sons, even though the older son didn't ask, it, ask for it. There is a deafening silence here. There's a crushing silence. The older son should have spoken up and said, Father, no, no way. I don't want it. I'm not taking it. I will not be part of the recalcitrance of this younger son. I do not support him. I stand with you. This is your property, and I want nothing to do with it until you give it to me on your own time schedule. That's what this son should have said, and he didn't say it. Second thing that the older son should have done is he should have been the reconciler between the two. Whenever you had an argument in ancient Israel custom and law, I think it actually was the law, you were supposed to, the, whoever was closest to the two who were having the argument needed to act it as a reconciler. The one closest was the elder son. The elder son should have taken his younger brother out into the field and said, we're going to have a talk. Now, I'm either going to talk this out of you or I'm going to beat it out of you one way or the other. But you're not going to do this to your father. That's what the older son should have done, and his silence is deafening. So the older son obviously doesn't have a right relationship with his father, and he doesn't have a right relationship with his brother either. But once again, we will get to that a little later on. Look in verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. Not many days later. Does that, does that catch anybody by surprise? Not long ago, we studied the parable of the great banquet. Do you remember the man who made a silly excuse when he said, oh, I've got to go inspect a piece of property I bought without seeing? That never happened. We talked about the fact that that was meticulously inspected. There was a lot of paperwork. There were many inspections. There's a lot of going back and forth. It didn't happen in a few days and usually didn't even happen in a few weeks. It was a long, drawn-out process. How does this young guy, after getting it from his father, how does he turn it into cash in just a few days? Obviously, he had this thing going before. He even talked to his father. Obviously, he's found a disreputable buyer because no one would do this who was an upstanding citizen. This is going to work against the young man eventually. But they found a disreputable buyer. A lot of the work has probably already been done so the man can get out of town. There is no grass growing under this boy's feet. So why do you think he wants to get out of town so fast? Why do you think he orchestrated it that way? Well, first of all, I'm sure this money's burning a hole in his pocket. Because we're going to find out he's not just looking for sin. He's looking for egregious sin. You know? And so he can't wait to get out and, and, and start it. 
But I also think he realizes what's going to happen, that public opinion against him is going to become bitter, if not violent. Because what he has done to his father is dishonorable. It is disreputable. And the people in the town are not going to appreciate it. And so, therefore, he needs to get out in a hurry before public opinion turns against him. This is going to make it very difficult for this man to come back. All right? It is going to be one of the borderlines. But look at the, look at the separation so far. He has just cut all ties with his father. He has just cut all ties with his brother. Now he's cutting all ties with his community. Now he's cutting all ties with the very people he grew up with. But that's not all he's going to cut ties with. We read that he goes into a far country. Why do you think he's going to go into a far country? What do you think a far country would be? Obviously a Gentile country. Because the kind of sin that this man is looking for is not the kind of sin that he's going to be able to find in a Hebrew village where there are boundaries. Where God has put boundaries in place. I mean, you can do sin illicitly under the tables, in the darkness, but he needs to do it in the open. He not only wants depravity, he wants total depravity. He wants to immerse himself in the sin. There's only one place he's going to be able to do that, is in a far country, a Gentile country where anything goes and all boundaries have been removed. So he, he, he leaves, he crosses when he does this a cultural line, as I said earlier, that is going to be very difficult for him to come back on. Now, at least he sold it to a Jew. At least he did that. Now, that's a good thing, all right? If he'd sold it to a Gentile, there is actually a formal ceremony that the townspeople would come hunt him down and have the, it's called kazaza in the Hebrew. I'm sure that's mispronounced. But in other words, it was one where the children would come out and say, not only have you cut off your father, not only have you cut off your brother, but you've cut off your, 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 uh, uh, your children, your, your, your legacy has been cut off because the land that would define you, that would be theirs after you, you have just taken away from them. So at least he didn't sell it to a Gentile, but he's getting ready to do the next worst thing, which is to take all the money that he got from that and blow it in a Gentile town. And that's what we hear. He took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. The word squandered, these, this, and again, the way that it's translated and the way that this parable is often told, the, the way the elder brother interprets it, the focus is on immoral sin. That, that the man goes and he hops and hops with, with prostitutes and gambling and drinking and, and, and he flitters the money away in that way. Well, no, the, the focus here of these words is not on the immorality of what he does. It's on the wastefulness of what he does. It is not on, uh, on just what he does. It's how he does it. And that's what these words bring out. The word for squander is a word that means to scatter. It's the same word that the sower scattered seeds in the parable of the sower. I mean, it's perfectly okay with seeds, but it's not perfectly okay with money. Okay? He's throwing it to the wind. He's scattering it around as if it was seeds. There's no concept. There's no thought in his mind. He doesn't think about the generations and generations of his forefathers who have bled and died on that property to help it. He doesn't care. He's taking it and he's flittering it around, scattering it as if it was seeds. Then he says that he was engaged with reckless living. Obviously, this is a word that the English translators are having a hard time finding a, a, a corollary for because here the ESV says reckless living, the, in, the New American Standard says loose living, the NIV says wild living, the New Revised Standard says dissolute living, the King James says riotous living. But the word itself, now listen, the word itself right out of the Greek dictionary, says madness that knows no bounds. Madness of a fallen soul where the boundaries have been removed. This is the kind of living that he had. No boundaries. 
And when there are no boundaries, there's nothing to hold you in check. The fallen soul will eventually implode. It will continue to press its boundaries and sin will get more and more wicked and egregious as time goes on. But once again, the focus here is not on the immorality, but the wastefulness of it. Once again, the Greek dictionary in this context says, wasteful, prodigal, profligate, a spendthrift lifestyle. He's blowing the money as if it was made out of water. Obviously, he didn't earn it, so it's easy for it to go. And that, of course, is what we read next, the 14th verse. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. This is just basic economics. If you have everything going out and nothing coming in, sooner or later, the coffers are empty. I mean, and the speed with which it's going out as opposed to the speed to which it's coming in, which in this case is zero, it doesn't take long for that coffer to be empty. So he spends everything. He, he, he finds he didn't save anything back. He doesn't invest anything. He just blows it all as if there was a madness that is driving him. He blows it all and there is nothing left. And then we hear that a severe famine arose in that country. And he began to be in need. Praise God for a famine. Famines are common in biblical times and still common in, in developing countries. We've been in, in Haiti and the Plateau Central in times when they have actually been in famine. You see, if you're in a society that depends on the rain fall for your crops and there's no irrigation, and if the rain doesn't fall, and I've been there, Pastor Jeff, they, where it hasn't fallen in a year before, you know, where it's just totally dry. Well, the first thing that goes are the plants and the herbs, the vegetables, the, the grains. They can't be supported. Later, probably the root plants, like potatoes, they go. After that, the fruit-bearing trees and the nuts, they, they can't stay around very long. Then the animals that depend on all of that. And then eventually, it is the humans who die of starvation. But there's something I want you to notice about a famine. Famines are caused by a variety of things, either too little rain or too much rain, either hail or weather, inclement weather, uh, uh, freezes that weren't expected, the coming of locusts, pestilence, war. But all of these brothers and sisters are the providence of God. God uses famines for his purpose. He uses famines to turn whole countries around, to change the course of history. As Daniel says that he is the one who changes the times and the season. He raises kings up and he puts them down. And one of the ways that he does that is through famines. You remember that it was a famine that drove Jacob and his family out of Canaan to Egypt where they ran into Joseph, where they were given a place to live to make it through the famine in Goshen. And that set up one of the greatest examples of redemption that you will find, not only in the Old Testament, but of all of Scripture. It's a beautiful picture, of, and not to, not to say it didn't happen, I don't doubt the historicity of that, but a living parable, if you will, of God's redemptive plan spelled out for you all because of a famine. So sometimes God changes the course of history with famines, and sometimes he just changes the course of a single person's life. It was a famine that drove Elimelech, if you'll remember, from his home in Bethlehem to Moab. He went there with his wife Naomi and their two sons. One of those sons found a, a wife there. Her name was Ruth, father, son, and son. All of the boys, all the men died and Naomi returned to Bethlehem. Well, you know the story of Ruth. Ruth was the mother of Obed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David. And that puts her in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Sometimes God uses famines to totally change a life. And that, brothers and sisters, is what we are seeing here. God provided a boundary where there was none. All boundaries removed. All laws gone. Everything goes to this young man. What did God do? He brought a boundary. Puts him in the midst of a 
of a, of, a fam, of a famine. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. Interesting uh, word there for hired. Virtually every English translation uses the word hired except the King James, which gets it closer to the original, which is joined. He joined himself. He stuck like glue. He tenaciously clung to this man. Boaz told Ruth when he was warning her of the dangers of the harvest field. He said, stick like glue to my young women because no one's going to mess with my young women if you're one of them. Paul warned the Corinthians and says, do not join yourself to a prostitute because the two become one flesh. You don't need that. That is the word of, uh, that's here, join to, to stick like glue. So the man sticks like glue. Now the reason Jesus, I think, would use a word like that is to give us an indication that the one he's sticking like glue to doesn't want him there and would like to get rid of him. So I can imagine this scene between the man and his wife, Jesus puts it this way, says, who sent him into the fields to feed his pigs. Now, Middle Eastern hospitality would require that at least he gives the, the, the guy a chance he's down and out. But how do you get rid of somebody you really don't want around who sort of glued himself to you? I can just see the wife telling the, the husband, well, if you want to get rid of a Jew, probably the best thing to do is give him a job feeding the pigs. Because the job is going to take care of it itself. He's not going to stay there very long. On the one hand, I think that shows the depth to where the son has fallen, that he would actually take a job like that. But he's given a job, which for all, all the Jews... Now, of course, you, you can see the Pharisees Jesus is talking to. First of all, they're just barely recovered from the story of, uh, of, of getting his inheritance and the father agreeing. Now they've got this guy who's living in a pig pen. And you know what they're saying, don't you? Bully. <laughs> He's getting what he deserves. Good for him. Right? This is exactly the way they would have looked at it. But of course, Jesus is really just setting them up here in the way he tells this story. He was sent into the fields to feed the pigs, and he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. He was longing to be fed by these pods or seed pods. Now, the Greek, way, the Greek word gives that away. These are pods from the carob plant, and, and they were impossible for him to eat. Now, why wouldn't he eat the, the, the food given to the pigs? We know it's not because he had a high sense of morality, and he didn't want to steal from the pigs. The only reason he wouldn't eat these pods is because they were not digestible. They couldn't be eaten by humans. And, 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 and if you're sort of health conscious, you, you may take exception to that. Wait, wait a minute. I, I eat carob every day. I, I love chocolate, but I can't eat chocolate, so the substitute is carob. And I'm even told that you go into any marketplace in the Mideast and you're going to find carob seeds for sale there. And there are even some of them that have such a high sugar content in them that they're considered to be a delicacy. So what happens? Why wouldn't this man eat those seeds? Well, 2,000 years of cultivation makes a big difference in a plant. And those are cultivated carobs. If you could find a wild carob, and there are some around in this region, if you were to be able to find one, you would find that they're not digestible, they're not palatable, they're not edible. You only fed it to the pigs at times of, of, of famine. And so therefore, if the man could have eaten these pods, he would. But then we have this one last statement, and this is where we're going to end it today. And no one gave him anything. So what happened to all of his good time buddies? What happened to all the people who helped him spend his inheritance? Well, they're all gone. But don't, don't think that this is the message of the parable. There are so many messages woven into this. Jesus is brilliant the way he's put this together. There are wonderful messages all the way through it. The, the good time buddies are exactly that. They're good time buddies. And when the good times quit, they're done. They're through. And no one would even give him a crust of bread. He is alone. 
He has isolated himself from his father, from his brother, from his community, from being a Hebrew, from his culture, from his background. And now he is isolated from the very people that he gave himself to. He is totally and completely alone. And let me tell you something. The enemy jumps all over that. If there is one tool that the enemy knows how to wield, it is to make you feel isolated. To make you feel alone. No one else could possibly be going through what I'm going through. No one has these kinds of thoughts. No one has these kinds of doubts or fears. No one struggles with that hidden sin the way that I do. And boy, the enemy can make you feel like you're the only person on earth going through that. But in this particular case, it's going to backfire on him. Because that's exactly what God wanted to happen. Praise God. For famines. Praise God because this man is blessed. This man is absolutely a man who is blessed, the likes of which it's hard for the unbelieving world to understand that. You know what would have been terrible for this man? Well, the terrible thing would have been if he'd taken wisely, taken half the money, invested it. So that he had an income, then go out and blow the rest of it. And then continuing on with his life in that sinful life of debauchery until he died. And then he faced the judgment of God as a sinner. That would have been devastating. If he had found another job. If there wasn't a famine to drive him into the lowest place that he could possibly be. If he could make a living in any other way. That would have been devastating. Because he would have done that until he died. He never would have repented. He never would have gone home. There never would have been a restoration. And he would die in his sins. But that's not God's plan. So God sends a famine. And he ends up in the pig pen. He's reached his lowest possible way. Brothers and sisters, and again, as I'm just going to keep driving this into you, this is not a story about a troubled young man. It's not a story about waste alone. This is a story about the fall of humanity and why we need a Savior and how God goes about that. And that we're going to see tomorrow. Well, I mean not tomorrow, next week. God willing. You know, we're going to see that God willing next week as as the repentance and the restoration and the redemption comes into this story. Praise God is glorious. But what I want to praise God for today is boundaries. Celebrate the boundaries of God. This man, as I said before, is one of the most blessed men on earth. And the Pharisees that Jesus is talking to, if Jesus were to articulate that, would say, are you crazy? This man has lost everything. He's cut himself off from his father, from his brother, from his life. He's sold his property. He has no more inheritance. He's absolutely poor. He wasted it all. He's in a foreign country wallowing in the mire in a pigsty. And you tell me this man is blessed. No. Jesus did. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who are spiritually bankrupt. Blessed are those who have run square into a boundary that God put in front of them, and they have fallen flat, and there is no farther depth that they can go to than where they are. Blessed are they, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are those who mourn. Those who recognize their sinfulness. Those who have had it brought in front of them. Smacked in the head with it. Those who have been devastated by it. Blessed are those because they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who recognize that they can't do this on their own. I have come face to face with the bottom of the barrel. I have looked into the abyss and the abyss has looked back. I need my father. I need to be restored to my Father. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are those who are fully aware of the mortification of their own sinfulness. Blessed are those who recognize the degree to which the Imago Dei has been tarnished and corrupted in them. Because those are the ones who will turn to Jesus 
and say, I need a Savior. So I celebrate boundaries. Brothers and sisters, sometimes I think that the church, yes, we are a benevolent organization and we want to help people. But sometimes I think that what we need are boundaries. Because as I said earlier, when you start categorically removing boundaries, one after the other, you start saying that which is a sin is not a sin. And you start celebrating it and you start turning morality around that that which is evil is good and that which is good is evil. When you continue to push the boundaries and every time you hit a boundary, you say, well, that's not a boundary. We're just going to remove the sin that sooner or later the fallen soul implodes upon itself. Sooner or later, the wickedness becomes so abject that there's nothing left but total destruction. And, 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 and if you, you, you don't think this is true, for goodness sakes, look around you. Look at the culture that you live in. Look at what you accept as normal. By the tens of millions, women are killing their babies in their womb. That's not normal. We have transvestites teaching preschool kids in reading time, telling them that gender is something that they can turn uh, on their own. That's not normal. That's the sin of the garden. That is taking that which is evil and saying it is good. And if you say it's evil, you're going to be accused of a hate crime. If you think that, I'm just making all this up. Ask yourself what the country is celebrating in the month of June. Something that the scripture calls an abomination. And yet it's moral. And we are immoral because we stand against it. That's what happens when boundaries are removed. So I'm going to end this by saying something that a lot of people are not going to understand. And I hope they don't take it out of context. I pray for revival. I pray that God will turn this country around, turn this Western culture around, turn this world around. I pray for the movement of the Holy Spirit, but I also pray for famines. I pray for devastating, desolating famines. If that's what it takes to turn this around, if that's what it takes, like this son, to repent and turn back to God, then bring on the famine. I would rather see famines than to see prosperity if prosperity leads to hell. When we take these elements, I want you to remember the Ten Commandments that we talked about earlier. And I want you to recognize those. Yes, we celebrate what Jesus did. He freed us from that. He freed us from the condemnation under the law. But he also maintained the law. He intensified the law. So that we would live according to our boundaries because God knows what's best for you. So we celebrate boundaries. And if what we need is a famine in order to have one, then so be it. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I know those are not typical words that come from the pulpits of this country. But I would much rather see a turnaround like we are going to see next week in this young man. The Holy Spirit move into his heart and change everything for him. I would rather see that for the lost and recalcitrant people of this culture, of this world, than to see them prosper and then end up in an eternity in hell. Lord, if it will take a famine, if it will take an earthquake, if it will take a hurricane, if it will take whatever it is, if it, whatever it is that you see in your providence, we pray that you would use it. We pray for revival first. We would much rather see your spirit work without something devastating like this. But if it requires something devastating, may it be. May it be so that people will understand their need for a Savior. In whose name we pray. Amen.